Thank you so much, Pastor Nate. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here at the Milton Church once again. And I thank you for the opportunity to share this morning. It's been a powerful time of worship and praise and celebration of our God. And I hope we love to worship God because he is absolutely worthy of worship. He is good, he is gracious, and he is great. So, yes, I am in transition. I have one more month as the pastor of the Miami Seventh-day Baptist Church. And when that time comes, I would have been there as pastor for 31 years. So it's a big transition and I look forward to, to what the Lord has in store, uh, serving as director of the Missionary Society. So um, that's, a, that's a huge job. And I'm still trying to figure out what I'm doing. Uh, but hopefully that will happen before it's time to do something else. I did not ask Pastor Nate how long I should preach today, um, mainly because I've preached here before, and, uh, and I don't usually pay attention to what he tells me. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, uh, but I found it interesting that uh, Levi said to me this morning, um, are you going to preach for your uh, one hour and five minutes and so I said, you know, I should, uh, mainly because I'm preaching today to a bunch of pastors, a lot of pastors. And I know that one of the things that pastors hate is listening to another pastor. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm glad to be here, glad to be here. And I, I, I certainly don't want to be like the, the pastor who was a uh, guest speaker in the church, and he'd been there, uh, this was his first time, and, and so as he got up to preach, you know, he said, well, how long should I preach to the congregation? And there was a deacon who always sat in the front row, and uh, the deacon piped up and said, well, pastor, you can preach as long as you want to, but we're leaving at 12 o'clock. <clears throat> So I, I'm hoping that by the time I'm finished, uh, at least some of you are still here. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would speak to our hearts from your word today. That you would allow us to be energized by your word, that your word would be life-giving to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to speak from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Matthew 9, 35 through 38, and I want to read those verses for us. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. A shoe company sent a representative to a foreign country. As soon as he arrived... He emailed his boss back home. Email said, catching the next flight home. 
Nobody in this country wears shoes. When he returned, the company sent another representative over to the same country. This second representative emailed his boss back home immediately. Send me all the shoes you can make as quickly as you can. The market is absolutely unlimited. No one here has shoes. I ask you today, what kind of vision do you have? What kind of burden tugs at your heart? And what do you do about your vision and about your burden? There is potential for a great harvest. But there is also a great problem. There are few laborers. And so this morning, I want to suggest to us that there are three actions that we must take if we're going to be the best laborers in the harvest of the Lord. We must visualize, we must agonize, and we must evangelize. As laborers, we must visualize. Verse 35 of the passage tells us that Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, it is vitally important that we see the needs around us. Pastor Carl talked about this yesterday. He talked about observing and seeing. Pastor Ney talked about it as well as he talked about vision. We must see what Jesus saw. He saw sheep without a shepherd. We must feel how Jesus felt. He had compassion on the multitude. We must do what Jesus did. He ministered to their needs. Evangelism does not have to be an organized church program. But evangelism must be intentional. We must see people for what they are. Lost souls in need of a savior. We must comprehend the consequences of them dying without Jesus. They are destined for the lake of fire. We must realize that we have the information that they need to rescue them from that fate. If we're going to reap a harvest of souls, then we must visualize. We must visualize the mission field. When we think about a mission field, many times we think of some place in a faraway country. Uganda, Malaysia, Nicaragua, the Fiji Islands, Uruguay. Many other places in Africa, Asia, South America. And all over the world. And it is true that those places are mission fields. But let's not overlook the fact that there are places that are virtually unreached here in America. The North American Mission Board, which is a Southern Baptist evangelism arm for our continent, estimates that there are 259 million people in the United States and Canada who do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And through their Send North America initiative, the North American Mission Board seeks to plant churches in five regions and 32 cities here in North America because they have identified those areas as largely unreached and largely unchurched. Even in our churches, even in our denomination, there are countless opportunities for us to be involved in national and international missions but we cannot just give money every now and then and think that, they, that we have fulfilled our responsibility when it comes to the mission field. Jesus went about all the cities and 
villages. The fact is, brothers and sisters, that we live in the midst of a vast mission field. The city of Milton is a mission field. The city of Janesville is a mission field. Edgerton, Fort Atkinson. The surrounding towns are all mission fields. Many of us here live in different places and our communities are mission fields. Your place of employment is a mission field. Your school is a mission field. The bowling alley is a mission field. The football stadium is a, is a mission field. The basketball arena is a mission field. Walmart is a mission field. And for many of us, our homes our mission fields. Wherever you go is a mission field. Wherever there are lost people is a mission field. So we must visualize. We must look around and see the lost people everywhere we go. And we must see the devastating condemnation that awaits them if they die lost in their sins. Lift up your eyes. Look at school, at work, at the gym, at the sports event, in the neighborhood, at home. Jesus saw them because he went where they were. And so I have a searching question for us, the first of three. Searching question number one, what would happen if we saw the people outside our congregation as Jesus saw them? I want to tell you about a man by the name of Brian Evans. Brian is a mid, er, well, early 50s. Lives in Miami. When our church, the Miami Seventh-day Baptist Church, sold its building about six years ago, moved to a rented facility, which is a Christian and Missionary Alliance church, that's where we still are. Brian was homeless and was sleeping outside of the church premises. So he was there when we got there. But I would notice that, that Brian was, was very neat, very tidy, because he would sleep outside the church at night, but once he got up, he would put away his cardboard bed, he would fold up his, uh, his sleeping materials, and he would put all of his earthly belongings in a little corner very neatly and that's where it would be for the entire day until he needed them again at night. But that's where he lived. That's where he slept because he had nowhere else. Brian was strung out on drugs. Brian was strung out on alcohol. But in a few months, Brian got saved. He did not get saved through the ministry of the Miami Seventh-day Baptist Church. He did not get saved through the ministry of Christ Community Church, which is a CMA church that owns the premises. He got saved through some church that I don't even know the name. But somebody invited him and he just went and God just got a hold of his heart. But Brian is still homeless. And Brian kept sleeping outside the, 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 the church for months but Brian began to take care of the place around him he began to pick up litter from the church premises he began to make sure that all around the church premises was okay nobody asked him he was just doing that he did that for several months, and that's just how he was. The pastor of the church had been building a relationship with him, speaking to him, sharing with him, counseling with him. 
got off the drugs, got off the alcohol. And the pastor of the church did something that I don't believe any one of us here would do because I've said it to my church. I know we would not have done that. The pastor of the church gave Brian a key to the church and said, I don't want you sleeping outside anymore. You may sleep inside. Brian got that key and he started sleeping inside the church. But as he started sleeping inside the church, he then also started taking care of not just outside the church, but inside the church. Again, nobody asked him. He just did that. And so he made sure everything was okay. He made sure uh, all of the, the facilities were, were taken care of. He would help the person who cleaned the church. He just did that. Brian has not relapsed. Brian had several things to do to get his life together. He had to, because he had been imprisoned for a while. He had to work on getting his driver's license back because it had been suspended for a long time. Brian was able to get some money together to buy a bicycle. He was able to get a little weed whacker. So Brian started going around and doing some weed whacking jobs. He was able to save some money up and pay for what he needed to do to get his driver's license back. And I remember one day him walking into my office at the church and uh, uh, put this thing down on my desk and with a broad smile on his face. And I said, what is this? He said, it's my driver's license. So I haven't had a driver's license in 25 years. Still working on his life. Brian has had the favor of God. He has wanted to have his own business, a landscaping business. A gentleman who had a landscaping business was retiring and um, quitting um, that, that job. The gentleman gave Brian his tools and his equipment, just gave them to him. Today, Brian owns a pickup and a trailer in which he he, uh, carries his tools, and he's the owner of a landscaping business. Brian is on the church payroll at Christ Community Church today because he is now the caretaker of the church. Uh, He does all the landscaping for the church. The church pays him, and Brian is doing extremely well. The next thing for him is he wants to get an apartment. Brian comes to our church on Sabbaths and goes to Christ Community Church on Sundays because that's what he wants to do. Nobody asked him to. And for for us, we have a certain uh, amount of setting up that we need to do when we go in on Sabbaths. And Brian does that every Friday evening. I never asked him to. But God got a hold of him. And God has done something in him. Now, I know that most of us may not have a story like that about homeless people who sleep at our churches. But I tell us the story to say to us that we don't know what God will do when God chooses. What would happen if we saw the people outside our congregation as Jesus saw them? He can. And he will do with them what he wants to do. So as we move a little deeper in the text, we will see that as laborers, not only must we visualize, but we must agonize. 
Because verse 36 tells us, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus saw the, the multitudes and he was intensely moved with sympathy and pity because of their condition. They're described as being sheep with no shepherd. This was a multitude of people who were utterly neglected concerning the interests of their souls. There was, a, there was no shortage of people and there was no shortage of problems. As Jesus looked upon their hurting faces, he had great compassion as to their situation. And today, there is no shortage of people and there is no shortage of people with problems. It is not up to us to judge those people. It is not up to us to condemn them. We must realize that we were once as lost as they are now. It is time that we stop looking at the lost world as drunks and addicts and gays and adulterers and thieves, etc. It is time that we see them as Jesus sees them, lost souls that need a Savior. The only way we'll ever see a harvest of souls is if we come to a place of intense burden for those lost souls. We will not see a harvest of souls until we finally grasp the fact that hell is real and people are going there. There is an absence of harvesters. The workers are few. Why? Why do so many of us stay out of the harvest? Well, fear sometimes. Fear of failure, fear, fear of rejection, fear of persecution. Sometimes it's indifference, indifference to any but our own problems, indifference to the souls of others, indifference to the Christless eternity of the lost. Sometimes it's ignorance, ignorance of the need, ignorance of our responsibility, ignorance of the scriptures, ignorance of how to share our faith. Sometimes it's busyness, busyness that, that uh, uh, because we have too many non-essential activities. Sometimes it's self-indulgence. It's just not convenient for us. I'm not comfortable sharing my faith. It's just too difficult. But brethren, we would do well to remember that every heart with Christ is a missionary heart. And every heart without Christ is a mission field. Maybe you know this song, push away from the table, look out through the window pane. Just beyond this house of plenty lies a field of golden grain. And it's ripened unto harvest, but the reapers, where are they? In the house. Oh, can't the children hear the father sadly say, My house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems my children all want to stay around my table. But no one wants to work in my fields. No one wants to work. In my fields. David Livingstone went to Africa as a lone missionary. After some time, his missions committee wrote to him saying, Some people would like to join you. What's the easiest road to get where you are? He replied, if they're looking for the easiest road, tell them to stay in England. I want people who will come even if there's no road at all. It is time that we quit playing the game. It is time that we quit going through the motions. It is time that we stop doing church. It is high time that we become the church. We must realize that we are the body of Christ. We are his hands and feet. But if we're the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? 
Why aren't his words teaching? And if we're the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing that there is a way and Jesus is that way? But wait, while we agonize over the fact that the laborers are few, let's ask our second searching question. What if this is really not a time of scarcity, but a time of abundance? So don't just ask, how do we get people to come? Let's also ask, what about those who are never going to come? Is ministry possible to them? Yes, because we are to go. There's a ministry today called Fresh Expressions. And their motto is, church can happen anywhere. Cultivating faith communities. Outside and alongside the box. They are about changing the church's default mode from maintenance to mission. They say it's like putting a new engine into the vehicle. So they say, let's just get the mindset that we can have church anywhere. So they teach their people to have church at the gym have church in the park. They have biker's church and cowboy church and quilting church and and, um, gardening church. Take the church to the people. That's their motto. So, we must visualize, we must agonize, and we must evangelize. Evangelism is defined as the spreading of the gospel of Christ by public preaching or personal witness. We saw earlier that our message in evangelism must only be the gospel of Christ. That is the message. Now Jesus begins to inform his disciples of the reality of a harvest of souls. Evangelism is a necessary work. The harvest truly is plenteous he says to his disciples look guys there are plenty of people who need to hear the message there are plenty of people who need to be saved the mission field is ripe and ready to harvest Jesus wanted these men to know that there was a great work to be done. Today there are many, many more people in the field than there was in Jesus' time. And these people are in great need. They are as sheep with no shepherd. They are on a path that leads to destruction. And today, more than any time in history, Evangelism is a necessary work. And Jesus said that those of us who labor in his field will share the joy of the harvest. There is a great song by Ray Bowles that expresses this joy from the perspective of the saved who somehow are with the Lord And part of that song says, thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave. Then another man stood before you and said, remember the time a missionary came to your church and his pictures made you cry. You didn't have much money, but you gave it anyway. Jesus took the gift you gave. And that's why I'm here today. Thank you for giving to the Lord. Jesus makes it clear that the harvest is ready. There are people who need to be reached. But he also declares that there was a great problem. There are few laborers to work the field. That is a problem that is present in 2019. There's a field ripe and ready to harvest. But there are few who are willing to work. Vance Havner said, The tragedy of our time is that the situation is desperate. 
but the saints are not. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have much work to do and little time to do it. We must give ourselves to it. The times demand urgent action. So we must be the prayer, we must be the answers to our own prayers. Jesus said, pray for laborers. Let's be those laborers. So the final searching question is this. What if we really understood that the primary purpose of our congregation is to send people out, not to gather people in? Christianity is a mobile faith. It is not a stationary calling. It is not a sedentary enterprise. We are a people on the go. Many times you've heard somebody say, I have to go. And there are many things that that could mean. Maybe it could mean that they no longer want to talk to you. So I have to go. Maybe they're saying, uh, I no longer want your company. I have to go. Maybe they're saying, my bladder is now calling the shots. I have to go. How about if I have to go means I've heard the master's call. I've heard him asking, who will go for us and whom shall I send? So my response is, I have to go. Brethren, it is time to go. It is time to go because somebody went for you. Somebody went for me. Noah went to the ark. And what a difference that made for all eternity. Abraham went to a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. And what a difference that made for eternity. Jacob went to a place called Peniel and said, I've seen God face to face. What a difference that made for eternity. Joseph went to prison and that made a difference for eternity. Moses went to Egypt and that made a difference for eternity. Joshua went to Jericho and that made a difference for eternity. Gideon went to the Midianites and that made a difference for eternity. Samuel went to Eli and that made a difference for eternity. Ruth, the Moabitess woman, went to Bethlehem and that made a difference for eternity. David, the shepherd boy, went to the battlefront and that made a difference for eternity. Elijah went to Mount Carmel and that made a difference for eternity. Daniel went to the lion's den and that made a difference for eternity. The three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro went to the fiery furnace and it made a difference for eternity. Jonah went to Nineveh and it made a difference for eternity. Philip went to the desert in Gaza and it made a difference for eternity. Paul went all over Asia Minor and it made a difference for eternity. I think of David Livingston, the pioneer missionary to Africa who walked over 29,000 miles. His wife died early in their ministry and he faced stiff opposition from his Scottish brethren. He ministered half blind. His kind of perseverance spurs me on. As I walk, I remember the words in his diary. Send me anywhere, he says to God. Only go with me. Lay any burden on me, he says to God. Only sustain me. Sever me from any tie, but the tie that binds me to your service and to your heart. And the gospel is that Jesus went to the cross. He went to the cross. 
When I grew up in Jamaica, we used to sing a little chorus that said, All the way to Calvary, he went for me. He went for me. He went for me. All the way to Calvary, he went for me. And now he set me free. And though my sins were many, many sins, Jesus washed them all away. And he pardoned me. That is the gospel. Jesus went all the way to Calvary. So brethren, will you go for somebody? Will you go to somebody? Will you go with somebody? Will you go by somebody? The gospel is only good news if it arrives in time. Somebody has to go. And I'm not quite finished, but I have to go.